next session up is on quantum computing, which is already having an unprecedented impact on every industry, which a, as a physicist and a mathematician, I just always want to make a point. Somehow or other, we've totally convoluted the word quantum. Quantum is the smallest thing possible, and yet just like what's coming, it represents really big ideas and really big developments. So um, to lead the discussion and hopefully make it as big as possible, let me introduce Kathy Wood, who's one of the board members and is uh, the CEO and founder of ARC Investment. And I'll let Kathy introduce her, pa her panelists as well. Thank you very much. Well, that's unusual for me, being introduced with music. So, um, uh, my name is Kathy Wood. I founded Arc Invest uh, five years ago to focus solely on disruptive innovation. We've centered our research and our investing on five innovation platforms. We are asked all the time, okay, what is the next platform? Well, the five are DNA sequencing, energy storage, robotics, artificial intelligence, and uh, blockchain technology. We're asked all the time, what is the next platform? What, where are we going to see the next disruptive innovation? And uh, quantum computing always comes to mind. Now, I've been doing this for a long time, uh, investing in innovation for a long time. And uh, 15, 20 years ago, I heard, oh, it's five to 10 years out. <laughs> Today, I hear it's five to 10 years out. And we really have to watch out for this because it is going to transform the world and probably disrupt a lot of investments in our portfolio. So um, I feel very privileged to, to be with this august uh, panel here uh, with expertise in this topic. Um, so uh, Professor Hagai Eisenberg uh, from Hebrew University, and he'll also describe a startup that he um, uh, is leading, uh, Dr. Dario Gill uh, from IBM, and Jack Hittery from Alphabet. Uh, uh, they are all very focused on this space and are going to provide some, uh, some answers. So I'd like to, if you would, talk, uh, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about how you uh, began your focus or why you're focused on uh, quantum computing now. And if you could explain, there are many levels of knowledge here. Uh, but if you could really explain to uh, an average investor uh, what this is and why we should be a, uh, paying attention to it, how it's going to change our lives, our businesses, our society. Just a little question there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Professor? Okay. Hello. Uh, so my name is Hagai Eisenberg, and I'm, as I introduced, from the Hebrew University. Uh, I'm involved in the field of, uh, you will say, quantum optics, quantum technology, uh, for the last 16 years, uh, and I'm at the Hebrew University for 13 years plus, uh, having a lab at the physics, uh, physics department. Um, now, quantum technology, uh, or uh, as uh, you may have heard, it, it's already called the second quantum revolution, is actually asking uh, what happens if we treat information uh, in a new way, involving not just logic, not just mathematics, but also physics. So when we combine physics into the way we treat information, we get some new insights, and it's mainly from this field of physics called quantum physics. That's why it's called quantum information, but it's really putting physics uh, together with information, and we get some new insights of, of how to process information, uh, transfer, transfer information, and also how to sense the world around, around us. So th these are called the three pillars of quantum technology quantum computation, quantum uh, communication, and quantum sensing. And they, they all offer new technologies uh, that can enhance the world. So quantum computing is probably the king or the queen, uh, because it's more known. But uh, on the other hand, because of these five to 10 years you mentioned, the other two are closer to realization. And there are companies already, like the one I'll introduce in the afternoon, uh, our company, Quantelar. Uh, and for that, the Hebrew University formed about 10 years ago. We were the first in Israel, and among, I would say, even the first in the world. 
when it only started in the world, we, we formed the Quantum Information Center at the Hebrew University. Uh, because of the, the interdisciplinary nature of this uh, field, it involves uh, researchers from, of course, physics and computer science, but also uh, the chemistry de uh, de uh, department, the applied physics department, and we even have some um, uh, members from the philosophy department, because fundamental, fundamental quantum ideas are very philosophical, and, and, and you can learn about the world from them as well. So I'll just uh, interject there. One of the uh, things we're finding at ARK Invest is uh, these platforms are converging, sectors are blurring, and just in terms of the way research is set up in traditional asset management firms, they're not ready for this. So it's, it's very interesting. Thank you. Dr. Yeah, I'm going to actually uh, tap on to something Hagai just mentioned about mathematics and, and information and how different it is, what is happening with quantum. If I were to stylize what has happened with computation over the last 50 to 60 years and what is going to be different, I would say that it's been a story about bits fundamentally, right? And that theoretical underpinning of what gave us the modern day computing was created by Cloud Shannon, right? And Alan Turing. And so there was a idea of these zeros and ones, these bits, and then there was an economic embodiment and technological embodiment of progress on that idea, which was Moore's Law, right? So lots of bits and very, very cheap. So when we look at where we are right now and we look into the future, is the future like the past? Is the future of computing just bits and cheaper and cheaper versions of them? Well, I'm going to argue that, that we're going to have that, but it's going to be a story of bits plus neurons plus qubits. And what is very interesting that is coming into play is that if mathematics and information gave us the bits piece, <coughs> biology and inspiration from biology plus information is giving us the neural and neural network piece, the AI piece, and physics plus information is giving us the qubit piece. So the future of computation is not going to be about one substituting the other, but complementing each other in doing things that is particularly well suited the problem of intelligence and the problem of knowledge for the world of AI. And for the physics piece, what can we tap it onto? Why will quantum matter? Well, Feynman's original idea was that we should build quantum computers to be able to model the physical world, as an example, to model the world of materials. In the end, nature is quantum mechanical. So if we could build machines that behave like nature, we may be able to revolutionize how we understand nature itself. How do we create future materials? But what is very interesting is that there's also been theoretical advances that would allow us to build these machines, these machines that create qubits and manipulate qubits, these quantum computers, to also do things that are not about nature, that are think about mathematics. And that's a very interesting opportunity as well, and I'm sure we'll talk of some of those applications. OK, Jack. Sure. <clears throat> First of all, it's great to be here. Uh, been uh, supporting Hebrew University for a number of years now and visiting often and bringing a number of the researchers to the States. And so it's great to see this conference here today. Um, I asked the organizers to put my XPRIZE affiliation on the slide rather than Alphabet for two reasons. One, XPRIZE, a nonprofit I serve on the board of, is something that has a deep connection to the university and to Israel. Uh, you may know that Space IL uh, just um, uh, had their event a few weeks ago to uh, first of all the teams in the XPRIZE lunar program to launch and uh, get to the moon. Unfortunately, the landing wasn't uh, uh, perfect, but I know, I, I believe in that team, and I'm sure they're going to uh, try it again, and that's the spirit that Israel has, which is that even if it does not succeed the first time, I'm sure it will uh, succeed again. And second, I'm here in my personal capacity um, uh, not to represent any of, the, uh, any of the companies I'm involved in. Um, so just to build on Haggai and Dario, who, who made already excellent remarks in this area, first, to emphasize that uh, when we think about quantum, it's not just computation, as Haggai mentioned, uh, the communication, uh, the sensing, uh, these are very, very important and actually nearer term, actually a little more, a little easier to actually do today. So in the sense of quantum sensing, just to give you one concrete example, uh, we may know that EEG is one of the ways to detect brain activity, right? Electroencephalography, EEG, you put leads on the head, you detect some of the brain waves, and we can go from there. There's been a technology around for years and years called MEG, magnetoencephalography, and that involves a little device called a squid, which is actually itself a quantum sensor, but the problem is it needs to be super cooled, and thus you have to go to a big hospital, put your head literally in a funny gizmo in the big white room, and it's obviously very difficult to carry that around since it weighs around three tons. 
Um, but recently in Nottingham, uh, there's research being done with a new kind of quantum sensor um, that due to advances in the technology can detect the magnetic uh, field that is generated by the electrical uh, activity in the brain. We know that electric and magnetic go hand in hand. So with the electric activity, we create a magnetic field and we can detect that using the sensor from Nottingham. And that is a little cat that you put on, you can walk around. So imagine for epilepsy studies, for other, you know, for other kinds of um, victims of and patients of neurological diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, so on and so forth, to be able to have that walking around and monitor them 24 seven for a week, two weeks, uh, that's actually a great advance. And that all comes from quantum sensing. Quantum communication, already mentioned by my two co-panelists here, is also very, very critical and something that is quite near term. The Chinese, uh, at the cost of $700 million, sent up a satellite to space. It's there right now, called the Misius satellite, M-I-C-I-U-S, named after an ancient Chinese scholar. And that satellite has already demonstrated uh, the use of entanglement and quantum teleportation to send messages over long distances. Now this teleportation is not from Star Trek. We're not teleporting any humans, uh, unfortunately, at this point, but we are teleporting information. Uh, and information can be teleported by leveraging the techniques and the principles that um, Haggai and Dario laid out. And so that is already happening today. Um, there's many advances. Quantelar is a company that uh, you'll hear about, I guess, this afternoon, and is in that space of advancing the field of QKD, quantum key distribution. So we know that today when you're online and you're uh, transferring your credit card to uh, e-commerce or things like that, that is encrypted first, then sent over, and then decrypted on the other end. Well, that kind of encryption is one kind of encryption typically based on the RSA uh, protocol, but there's other kinds of encryption and cryptography that we can now envision in the very near future and literally happening today. One of them is to distribute the key using these quantum principles. So uh, I think it's great that we can emphasize in this panel that it's not all about just computing, which is actually of the three, one of the most difficult of these quantum uh, applications, but, um, but also the other two as well. When it comes to quantum computing, it's very, very exciting. And as Dario mentioned, it's not something that we envision will replace uh, the classical computing that we have today. We're gonna go into a hybrid mode of side-by-side -side activity. In fact, when you type your quantum programs today for an actual quantum processor. We write in Python as an example, which is a language that's known to many people in the classical world. Uh, we write up our programs, we run them on a classical machine to then control the quantum uh, machine that is nearby or perhaps over the cloud. Um, and so it's an exciting moment where I think within the next five to seven years, there'll be uh, five, seven, 10, maybe 15 different companies out there offering a quantum computer based on the cloud. Um, IBM already has a number of quantum computers that you can access on the cloud, others do as well. And so it's a moment now when you don't have to buy one of these things necessarily as an academic or as an independent researcher or a small company, you can access it over the cloud. So this is kind of the, 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 the access to this is starting now and it's exciting to see that. So we're talking about the opportunities and all of the excitement uh, around quantum technology. Uh, uh, but what about the risks? Uh, what Are there applications that you can envision that would create a lot of risks uh, out there and that we should, as investors, as you know, consumers, businesses, that we should be thinking about? Uh, maybe we'll start, we'll start with uh, Dara. Sure. So um, I think that, that, you know, the very famous example, right, of it has to do with uh, potential use of future quantum computers. Uh, there will be a type of quantum computer that are known fault tolerant quantum computers. So today's quantum computers that you can access on the cloud, you know, so we, we launched three years ago a, a small quantum computer in the cloud. And ever since, you know, there's now over 120,000 people using and writing programs on them. Mm -hmm. Those computers are about you know, learning how to program them and in the sort of horizon over the next three, five years, seven years, we envision uh, a regime called NISC, these noisy intermediate scale quantum computers that can be used for a variety of applications, right? Like chemistry, materials modeling, machine learning, optimization. But were we to get eventually to a fault tolerant quantum computer, meaning a type of quantum computer that you could program and run indefinitely, that would be protected from errors. 
then there are known algorithms already that would have very significant speed up advantage compared to what you can do classically. And most famous among them is something called Shor's algorithm, named after Peter Shor, who was at Bell Labs in the 1990s and currently a professor at MIT, that basically you know, wrote uh, a paper, an algorithm that said that if you had a fault tolerant quantum computer, you could factor numbers exponentially faster. Why does that matter? Well, today's you know, RSA encryption mechanisms, uh, as were alluded, rely on the fact that factoring, if I, get, if I take two prime numbers that are large and I multiply them together and I get the product, I'm going to use that product as the public key that we're going to send in an open channel. And the two prime numbers are the private keys that we each have. Mm -hmm. So the basic of all encryption, many encryption uh, approaches, is that the directionality of the problem is very different. To multiply two numbers is very easy, but to factor and figure out what those two primes is very hard. Mm -hmm. So we use that principle to create an efficient encryption protocol. So today, encryption around the world relies on the fact that if I give you the public key, you know, the product, it's very hard to find the private keys. But if you had a fault tolerant quantum computer, you would be able to do that problem efficiently. So what does that mean? Well, it means that over time, we're going to have to replace all, you know, most of current encryption that we use in the world today with new protocols. The good news is that such protocols do exist. Uh, you know, we and many other institutions are involved in defining and creating them. NIST has a very significant effort underway to eventually define a standardized way to enable this protocol. But it's going to mean that we're going to have to change encryption around the world and how it's done. So there is a solution. If we do nothing and sit on it, eventually this will be a massive problem, right? Because you could be able to use this to be steal all secrets and all information. So we, as a, you know, the world, need to migrate to a new standard. And, uh, but we can do that, right? And, and what I want to caveat is there's a lot of hype around this on uh, quantum computers, you know, being able to break encryption. It is not around the corner. Right? This would require a very large fault-tolerant quantum computer, which is going to take a while. Jack? Um, well, yeah, unless the corner is very, very long, like you know, many years away, then, then it's around the corner. But no, it's not around this corner <laughs> um, today. So I, I think that, like any technology, you want to understand the implications of that technology. And again, by this technology, I think we should talk more broadly, quantum computing is one of the pieces, but the same core principles that um, my colleagues and I have been talking about here drive all these applications of quantum. I think really what is safe to say is that the next 10, 20 years will be the age of quantum applications. Um, you know, from the year 1900 to the year 1930, approximately, um, a handful of people created the science and the theories that drive everything that we on stage uh, do every day. Um, and it took actually quite a few years to realize that. Uh, Darren mentioned Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman, in a famous speech in 1980, uh, said, nature is not classical, damn it. Yes, he did say the word, damn it. Um, and uh, he then published that in 1981. And that was one of the speeches slash papers that kind of got us going. But you can think about the question, why did it take so long? It was clear from the implications of quantum mechanics from 1927 uh, and, in, and work just done around that time that one day it would be possible. There was an experiment done in 1922 called the stern gerlach experiment, which demonstrated this unusual, weird behavior uh, at the quantum level. And if you look at that stern gerlach experiment now, today, many, many years later, you can see that you could probably make a qubit, make one of these unusual bits out of, uh, out of something even like that experiment. But it was not really realized until many, many years later. And now we're sitting here in 2019 talking about the beginning of the era of applying these uh, kinds of applications. So I think we have a long ways to go. The next 10, 20 years will be very exciting. Um, but uh, I think that the, the main implications of this technology are how to hybridize it with the current technology. How do we use our current technology and involve quantum and bring these two together? I think that'll be a main focus for a lot of researchers. But one, one thought, if I could add, something has changed over the last just few years. Because the realm of you know, quantum information and quantum information sciences indeed have been around for many decades. So what's different? Why are we talking about quantum? 
is because there's been serious technological progress across these three domains of sensing, communication, and computation. And even in the realm where we're very involved at IBM on, on, on computation, there is a big inflection point in that we have built small but working quantum computers that are noisy. They are available, right? And people are writing programs, executing programs on a quantum processor. There's been, you know, in our community, over 180 scientific publications alone just using a real quantum computer. So um, I like to distinguish now sort of three phases now in this quantum computing phase. There was the quantum science phase, which is going to continue going forward. I, I argue that right now we're in a getting quantum ready phase, which is learn the skills, learn how to program these computers. And we will ultimately, in the 2020s, enter a quantum advantage phase. And the quantum advantage phase will be the moment where we have advance enough technology that we can exploit quantum computers for scientific and commercial advantage. Mm -hmm. But it's not like we are in 2010 either, right. or 2005. Something has happened, and, and it was advances in, in you know, processing technology, new qubit devices, you know, cryogenic technology, control electronics, and all of that has come together. And finally, we have something that actually has begun to work. Interesting. Professor? Um, if I if I can take it to a slightly different direction, because both of my friends already really showed the the risks in uh, in the develop the technological de development. So I'll say that uh, we, I see another risk that, and this is more if you want that we should concern investment uh, as well, and that's about the manpower or, uh, that 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 will advance this technology in the next, let's say even first or second uh, decade, because, um, because of the inter interdisciplinary nature that was mentioned and the broad knowledge that, that has to be learned, learned be, be before people can really build uh, things like that, it all sits in the basic sciences today. And people are learning already in the basic sciences how, how to integrate, but the amount of students we, we put out is, I would say, it's definitely not, not, not enough for the industry. So, in the last 10 years, uh, and I'm, I would say, medium-sized lab at the Hebrew University, I produced, I evaluate about six, seven PhDs. So that's about 10 years. Wow. And the, the people that can really go and work in this industry right now. Mm -hmm. So I if we look at the 1950s, it, 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 it was again physicists that uh, built the first transistor, the first laser. I'll mention that later in my, in my talk in the afternoon. But, but it, it took a while until what, what we call today electrical engineering yeah. uh, department uh, formed and, uh, and people started to, to really educate young people into this new technology. And only I would, <coughs> you can catch me not uh, accurate, but I'll say that only in the 70s, uh, even though IBM was formed already in, in the 60s, but, uh, but uh, it's the same like D-Wave, Google, IBM, uh, Regetti. But, uh, but uh, it, it took quite like 20 years until you really had people coming out uh, to, to the, uh, that ca can be employed in this field. And then um, if we don't take care of that and we don't start our own quantum engineering departments in the universities and the rector of the Hebrew University is sitting here, or something similar, or at least think about it. <laughs> it's not just the responsibility of the Hebrew University, but as a leader, we should. Uh, and uh, we, we will stand in, in, I don't know how to translate it into it, uh, into English, uh, in front of a, a broken uh, well uh, <laughs> that we cannot drink, drink for, uh, from. We know everything, but the technology will not advance. So, Kathy, can I just add, sure, add sure, one point? Um, Hagai is absolutely right. We did a kind of back of the envelope analysis. This is not a, a, a deep survey that we did, but just literally went on a spreadsheet and added up all the names of the people that we knew in the field that our colleagues at companies, our colleagues at universities. We came up with a number of about 900 to 1,000 human beings on the planet Earth today who we would consider a quantum computing expert. That's the number we came up with. Now, others may say maybe there's a few less, a few more, but it's something like 900 human beings out of 7.3 billion humans that uh, we would consider to be quantum computing experts today. Um, and so it's definitely a need. Uh, all of us, I think, are concerned about this. And if you compare that to AI, AI today has hundreds of thousands, millions of people, I think you can argue, that have some expertise in, in the level of AI. But quantum is, is such an early stage in that sense 
that we have not trained enough, enough individuals. And it'll take both the universities and if Ram is here, is Ram here? Okay, yeah, we definitely want to emphasize Hebrew universities and happy to help out with, with the support there. Um, but Ram Sari has done a fantastic job at Hebrew U taking over as head of research and uh, we want to support that as much as possible. Um, so the universities have a role to play, but I think we in the corporations have a role to play as well uh, in training uh, PhD students and postdocs at university supporting that, but also training our own people. Um, we do a lot of training uh, at our company around this area. There's a lot of interesting engineers who want to know more about this topic and don't have the background necessarily from academia because they're already working five or ten years now uh, as a software engineer or other kinds of hardware engineers. So we spend a lot of our time training them into this area. They're not necessarily going to become quantum computing experts per se, but enough knowledge to uh, have facility with the Python programming and understanding of I that. I think that that's really, really key, right? To yeah. build that community. Yeah. Because we can have different levels of abstraction, right? I mean, not everybody needs to be a quantum expert to be able to learn, you know, even at the level of running a program right. or eventually they can be embodied in circuits that you embed as a library into other applications. So I think we need to build a community that goes well beyond the realm of just physicists. So that's very important. And, uh, but I'm going to second absolutely very strongly the need for quantum engineering departments. Um, this is something that is a hallmark of what is happening right now of, you know, beyond physics and bring all these talented, you know, uh, professions uh, around this. And you're seeing University of Chicago is doing this and MIT, there are plans to do this. So I think this is going to be a growing trend of the ability to create, you know, perhaps may start as centers, like quantum engineering centers or so on, but ultimately that there will be department across all of these areas to bring those skills into it. Because it's going to be part of the permanent technological uh, landscape, quantum. It's not going to go back, right? Sensing, communication, and computation will be here with, for the long run. So uh, two more questions. Uh, we're, we're out of time. Just uh, one can be answered uh, very quickly. The 900 to 1,000 people, are there any surprises in terms of where they are located today? Well, right now, there's mainly um, five or six main centers where they are. There's a lot here in the US. Outside the US, Delft and um, the Netherlands in general has a very strong expertise uh, in this area. Um, Israel, there's growing uh, bodies of, of people in Israel. In Australia, uh, uh, I just was in Australia recently, and there's a lot of activity happening in, in four or five of the leading universities in Australia. So there are places, and some of these centers have been going for decades. Um, before it was hip to say you're in quantum, uh, some of these centers had been just at it year after year after year. And now, of course, the, the, the spotlight is here and they're ready for their, for their moment in the sun. Yeah. So I would add Canada, Canada, Canada and uh, Switzerland yeah. to, to yeah. the least ETH. Yeah. OK, terrific. And finally, I'm from the investment uh, industry. Um, are, there, are we in the picks and shovels phase? For example, artificial intelligence. Picks and shovels, you, you use semiconductors, NVIDIA, AMD, and so forth. Are we, is it too soon even to think about that? I'm talking about the public marketplace, not the private. Uh, is, is there? Well, pu public is a little hard because there's no pure plays right now in the public equities sphere. On the private investing side, uh, we track about 60, 65 venture-backed startups that you could say are in the quantum realm that we discussed here today. Not all necessarily computing, but again, including communication uh, and sensing. If we include all of QIS, as we call it, uh, quantum information sciences that, that you know, um, the, the field uses that term, uh, we track about 60, 65 venture-backed startups where there's some recognized institutional venture backing of that corporation. We think that's going to grow. Uh, and we think many of those obviously will be acquired by some right. of the large companies. And that's going to be a natural cycle that is just beginning right now. So there's no enablers in the public markets that... Well, again, the, you know, uh, uh, here on stage, you have two you know, large companies sure, who are obviously large. very dedicated to this. And there are other companies who I think will get into the fray um, our two companies have taken leadership in this area, but it doesn't mean that other companies aren't watching us very closely right, right. And, and, and seeing the progress we're both making and are probably going to follow suit, I think, very, very soon. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this is, was a wonderful panel. I learned a lot, uh, and I hope you did as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.